Hi everyone, it's Ted Bauman here, editor of The Bauman Letter here at Banyan Hill Publishing uh, with my regular Friday video. Uh, today I want to start just quickly by acknowledging some comments that I got uh, from last week's video regarding uh, my use of normal rather than logarithmic scales in part of my argument. I acknowledge, uh, thank you very much for pointing that out. Uh, and I agree that uh, using log scales for some purposes uh, is actually much more illustrative. So. Uh, with that in mind, let's look at the two charts that I showed last week uh, in log scale first. The first one shows the uh, S&P 500 going back to 1950 in log. Now, my point at the time was that prior to around 1990, early 90s, the stock market was somewhat more sedate uh, than uh, it has been since then. Uh, I stand by that argument um, for two reasons. One is that uh, just in terms of log scale, you can see very clearly that the stock market has risen uh, in terms of percentage increase uh, far more rapidly in the last uh, decade uh, than it had in previous decades. Also, if you look at the volume figures, uh, just massive trading volumes on the stock market. Let's look at the other chart that I showed. This is the uh, total Fed assets, also in log scale, uh, but not all that different from the chart I showed before. My point, folks, is simply that the increase in liquidity from the Federal Reserve has, in fact, changed the nature of the U.S. stock market. It has uh, increased volumes. Um, it has pushed up prices higher than they would be otherwise. And that's largely because uh, very low interest rates and the abundance of liquidity um, has made investing in stocks a more attractive proposition than other types of investing, like fixed income and so on. Back in the old days, people spent a lot of their time investing in uh, dividend-paying stocks and bonds and whatnot in order to achieve um, reliable streams of income for retirement. Now people chase stocks, and there's lots of money out there that allow, it, uh, allow people to do that. So I stand by my argument. I agree, uh, and I apologize for not using log um, scales on my charts, but I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever to my argument. Um, it certainly doesn't make me an absolute moron, as uh, one person described. Anyway, let's go on to today's argument. I want to talk today about the relationship between the market and the economy. Now, as we know, there's been a huge discussion, uh, and I've been an active participant in it, about the relationship between a booming stock market, uh, at least uh, the recovery since the March lows, uh, and what is clearly an economy in dire distress. Now, you may remember this uh, picture that I made the rounds a while back. Uh, it shows just the striking juxtaposition of the Dow having the best week since 1938 at a time when 16 million people had lost their jobs. Now, um, people like me have been suggesting that the problem is that uh, this is somewhat of an illusion and that uh, you, cannot, you cannot have a booming stock market in a context of a declining economy, uh, particularly uh, as spending consumer spending is gutted as a result of the lockdowns and the slowdown uh, in economic activity attendant on the COVID-19 virus. But here's the thing. I did a little bit of research, and if you look back at the last couple of recessions, in fact, uh, this pattern that we're seeing right now is not all that different. It's just that it's sped up a lot. Now, here's a chart that shows the four-week moving average of initial claims for unemployment uh, compared to the Wiltshire 5000. Uh, price index, which is basically all stocks in the United States. Now, as you can see, um, the Wiltshire tends to reach a bottom when the rate of change of unemployment figures uh, peaks. In other words, when the number of unemployment claims, the four-week moving average of unemployment claims is at its peak, that's when the market reaches its bottom. And then at that point, it begins to recover again. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the market always bottoms when employment is at its highest, but when the news is coming out that employment is increasing. And that's pretty much what I've been saying, is that um, investors are going to react to the unemployment news, um, but more importantly to the news on the impact on um, GDP. So what happens is that when the rate of change of unemployment figures, when um, the number of unemployed is starting to slow down week by week, people get the impression that that means that there's going to be a big turnaround. And so, yes, I think that it's fair to say that that's probably what has driven a lot of the optimism in the market. The big question is, is it justified based on the type of financial crisis, or sorry, economic crisis that we're facing as a result of COVID-19? 
Well, let's first ask how fund managers feel. Now, firstly, um, this comes from the Bank of America uh, Global Survey of Fund Managers that just came out uh, recently. And this shows, uh, the first chart shows that uh, 75% of, of fund managers, the people who manage other people's money uh, to invest, believe that we are looking at a U or W shaped recovery um, rather than a, uh, you know, a V shaped recovery, which is down there at the very bottom. These are the people whose job it is who make money by investing other people's money. And a lot of them feel like we're either in a, um, uh, a U or W shaped pattern or that this is a short term bear market rally. Um, one out of four of them believes it's a bull market, and kudos to them. Um, that's a pretty brave position, but nevertheless, that's what it is. The next chart shows uh, the average cash balance um, in fund managers, and you can see that it's at its highest level uh, since the 9-11 attacks. And essentially, that shows that uh, a lot of people are keeping their powder dry, uh, and that is uh, another sign of pessimism. The third chart I want to show you on this uh, topic is a recent one that came out from Investopedia, and it shows that right now um, the bearish investors tend to be older. They tend to be people who are the boomer generation. Bullish investors tend to be clustered in the millennial and Gen X, whereas uh, boomers, people who really have a lot to lose, uh, are the most bearish. Now, I think that's a perfectly reasonable position, and in fact, probably I'm biased in that sense. Uh, I'm technically a late-term boomer, uh, based on when I was uh, born, uh, but even people who were born at the height of the baby boom literally don't have enough time in the market to be able to afford big losses, so they are the ones who tend to be the most bearish. And quite honestly, uh, most of the readers of my Bauman letter probably fall into that category. So if I'm a little biased um, and a little bearish, it's because I'm looking out for their interest but also because I genuinely believe that you have to be extremely judicious right now about where you put your stocks. Now, let's talk about the overall evolution of what's going on. And I think the best way to look at it is that we started the uh, COVID-19 economic crisis with a liquidity problem. The liquidity problem was essentially that banks, uh, or rather companies, were looking to shore up their balance sheets by running to their banks to draw down um, their credit uh, facilities so that they could have enough cash to survive the problem. You had people in the foreign sector scrambling for dollars to meet uh, repayment obligations denominated in dollars. You had people selling treasuries all over the place to try to raise money. People were selling gold to try to raise cash. Um, and essentially all this led to markets becoming extremely illiquid as the number of sellers outweighed the number of buyers. And at that point, that's when the Fed stepped in and started pumping liquidity into the market. Now, um, that's essentially what the, uh, the Fed and Chairman Powell had said their intention was, was to make sure that there was enough money in the market that people didn't have to panic sell things, leading to a financial crisis on top of an economic crisis. Now, um, let's just uh, revisit what that involved. It involved about $3 trillion worth of liquidity going into the market in very, very rapid um, a short-term pace, and that is also already larger in magnitude than the total amount of liquidity that was pumped into the market in the 2008-2009 crisis, which was a liquidity crisis, which was a financial crisis, not a real economy crisis. Now, so we've had a liquidity crisis, the Fed has stepped in, it has put money into the markets, it is buoying stock prices as a side effect, that's, they claim that that's not the main reason why they're doing it. Um, debt markets have not collapsed. <clears throat> in fact, it seems fairly clear um, that the Fed has actually not really bought very much corporate debt at all. Uh, in fact, all they've done is talked about the likelihood that they would do so if necessary, and that alone has been enough to keep credit markets stable, i.e. jawboning. So remember that the Fed is a very powerful institution. I agree with those of you who say that it is very powerful. Not quite sure I would link it back to the Rothschilds in the 18th century, but anyway, um, when you have control over that amount of money creation, you do have enormous power. And even if you don't use it, uh, just being able to talk a good uh, line around what you might do if necessary is sometimes all it takes. But let's look at what stage of the crisis we're in now. 
Now, companies that scramble to acquire liquidity to tide themselves through the crisis is one thing, but we're now getting into a stage of the crisis which you could maybe call the solvency stage. What it means is that um, no matter whether they were able to get uh, short-term corporate debt rolled over uh, successfully at uh, reasonable rates or not, companies that are simply not selling their wares because people are not going out to buy them are going to run into cash flow problems and eventually they're going to become insolvent. Now we've seen a wave of bankruptcies, uh, J.C. Penney, we've seen um, Neiman Marcus, we've seen a number of large companies that are essentially at death's door. Uh, and that number is going to increase and liquidity cannot solve that problem. You cannot simply pump money into credit markets and into equity markets and expect to solve what is effectively an economic problem. Now this is exactly why Chairman Powell uh, is going uh, to the Congress and going to the press and saying we have to have fiscal stimulus because he knows the Fed can solve a liquidity problem but the Fed cannot solve a solvency problem. It cannot make the economy go. That requires people buying and selling and companies that are not um, able to sell their goods because people don't have the money to buy them when you have 16 million people unemployed then yes you have a serious economic problem that the financial sector cannot solve. So my bare thesis has all along been that that is the case, that we have many more companies that are in that kind of a scenario than those that are leading the market. So uh, just on that score, let's have a look at the shape of the current recovery or the current uh, mini boom that we're having. Now this uh, share uh, or this uh, graph right now shows the market cap of the largest five companies in the S&P 500. And as you can see, it's reached about 20%. The only time we've ever been in that situation before was back prior to the dot-com boom uh, and then back in the 1980s when you had some big energy companies and companies like GE uh, that were huge industrial behemoths, or behemoths rather, that uh, covered uh, big chunks of the stock market. So right now we're in a situation where the, um, when we talk about the stock market, what we're really talking about is the trend being set by the very top companies. Now, who are those companies? Well, let's first look at a chart that shows the, uh, the different um, slicing and dicing of the stock market. At the very top is the Triple Q Trust, which is essentially the NASDAQ. It's up 5.24% uh, uh, this year. At the very bottom is the Small Cap Value Index, which is all the companies out there uh, that make things, that do things, uh, in the real economy down by almost 36%. In between you have a number of different um, measures. The S&P uh, as a whole is down about 11% but an equal weighted version of the S&P uh, is down by twice that which shows you uh, that's the 20.36 uh, the blue line that shows you that the majority of companies in the S&P 500 are not actually booming. So when people say that the stock market is going great guns thanks to the Fed, what they're really saying is that the, the, the top technology companies are carrying the market along, whereas everybody else, all those companies that are going bankrupt because they're sol facing solvency problems, are not doing well, and that's reflected in the rest of the uh, indexes, indices. Now let's look at what's happened to those top five companies. As you can see, uh, the very top is Facebook. Um, it really has risen dramatically. All of them have risen dramatically since the beginning of the year. Uh, Facebook followed by Apple, uh, then Microsoft, uh, then uh, just basically the, you can see where the S&P 500 is since the end of March. Um, but uh, Alphabet and um, Amazon a little bit trailing below those two. Uh, that's because those two companies are uh, also involved in very much real world economy stuff. So it's not surprising to see Alphabet and Amazon at the bottom of the pack. Nevertheless, they still are up dramatically. So it's those, it's those five companies, folks, that are driving the increase in the stock market as a whole. Now, let's look at their actual valuation story. Uh, Amazon's PE is 118. This is, you know, you can see at the bottom what the S&P 500 is. And just for clarity, some people did question my um, argument that the uh, PE ratio was higher than it's been um, uh, only twice before in the 20th century. I've been using the case Schiller uh, ratio, which is a moving average ratio. So just to clarify that, um, I agree that there have been times when the normal unadjusted ratio has been higher, uh, but I'm using the uh, Case-Shiller. 
So Amazon, 118, Netflix, 90, Facebook, 31, Microsoft, 30, Google, 28, Apple, 25. Folks, these are extremely high valuations. Uh, also, in terms of earnings growth, um, you're getting peg ratios of three, four uh, for Google and Amazon. That means that uh, people are willing to pay a premium, not just for um, the earnings that these companies generate, but the speed at with, with which these companies' earnings are growing. Price to sales, also very high. Price to book, very high. Now, look at the key figure here, which is the percentage uh, below the 52-week high that these companies are trading at. Um, Google, not surprising, is the, the lowest down because of the hit on its advertising revenue. Um, but the rest of them, very close to where they have been all along. Uh, compared to the S&P 500, which is 13% below its previous 52-week high. So the basic message here, and what I'm trying to, um, in a sense, I'm trying to frame the, my, my argument about what's happening with the economy in the stock market, is that yes, the Fed was able to step in and solve the liquidity problem, but we are now in the point where the problem is whether companies can remain solvent with an economy that is simply not happening. And on that score, it's important to pay attention to what's happening on the ground uh, as lockdowns are released. The news I'm seeing says that people are not going back to bars and restaurants and other places in the numbers uh, that they were before the crisis. And that's because it's not just about the governors locking down businesses. It's about people not wanting to get sick. Um, for example, we now know that the COVID-19 can cause serious problems for children. That's going to have a huge impact on the attitude of whether parents are going to go out and go to restaurants and all these other things. So we're now in the solvency phase of the crisis. And the only thing at this point that is buoying the stock market is an investor willingness to continue to push up the valuations um, and the multiples of the big technology companies. My argument is that that cannot go on forever. Uh, eventually, you run into limits into how much uh, you can value a company that uh, provides movies to people to watch at home while they're under lockdown, uh, or companies that provide a social media platform. Eventually, there have to be real people out there in the economy producing things and also consuming things. Now, what's the value proposition in that kind of a scenario? Well, for me, there's two things. One, you want companies with strong balance sheets. Two, you want companies that are beaten down in terms of value but have a strong business model that can rebound quickly post the COVID-19 virus. Now, I've argued that case for housing, for example. Now, you can say the whole housing market is depressed, but that doesn't mean that all housing companies are going to go bankrupt and stop operating. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a housing construction sector afterwards. So what you do is you look for the companies that are at the... Uh, trading at the lowest valuations, their low, historically low PE ratios. You look at their balance sheets, make sure that they're not over indebted, and you say, now let's buy these companies and ride them back up. Because eventually, you're not going to be able to squeeze any more gains out of the stock market just by relying on the big uh, technology companies. You have to start looking for value at the bottom. And that's precisely the time to do it when um, companies are falling down left, right, and center, the retailers, and so on look for the companies that are not going to fail because they provide essential goods and services, the housings, companies like that. Now, uh, there are lots of other sectors, and I'll probably talk about those in future videos, but for now, that is my key message for today. We've reached a stage in the crisis when the Fed cannot do more, and it looks highly unlikely that Congress is going to agree to do exactly what Chairman Powell is asking for, which is to put in some more fiscal stimulus. If they don't, if Congress is not willing to pony up more fiscal stimulus, then we are definitely, I believe, going to see a second drop in the stock market. And it's going to be led by the fact that um, companies without customers, without money, cannot remain solvent, and neither can a stock market. So this is Ted Bauman signing off. Remember, you can subscribe to the Bauman Letter uh, by clicking on the link above, or you can subscribe to this channel if you're not already by clicking on the link below. Uh, I'd like to have you as a Bauman Letter reader if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> we put out 12 issues a year along with numerous other communications. Uh, so please consider subscribing to the Bauman Letter. That's it for me for this week. Uh, I appreciate all your comments, positive and negative. Um, and I do really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. I'll talk to you again next week.